So let's talk about and review what is a manipulative. A manipulative is what? A physical object. So manipulatives are physical objects that are used as what? We already talked about this. Do you have it? Used as teaching tools to engage students in the hands-on learning of a math concept. <coughs> a physical object, something they can pick up and move around as we discussed a minute ago with your requirements for your manipulative. Okay, it has to be a physical object. All right, so many times with primary, those physical objects could be straws or popsicle sticks that they can count out and you wanna decorate them. Um, and then you, if you're gonna use them for place value, if you're gonna use them for carrying, you need at least three place value cups or containers that you can make and decorate. All right, um, maybe I should have said a fourth requirement of manipulative is that you have to make it. But that was kind of implied because I'm grading it. <coughs> Later on, when you're not being graded for it, you can buy stuff. Okay, it can be as simple as pebbles. Um, it can be uh, little toys or whatever. Think dollar store, okay? But um, it's gotta be something that you made and decorate, okay? So it's physical objects that are used as teaching tools to engage students in hands-on. So physical objects, hands-on learning of a what? Math concept. Those ideas are important. Physical objects, they're teaching tools that are hands-on and they have to then learn. So it's a teaching tool to engage students in the hands-on learning of a math concept, an arithmetic concept. And the purpose here, of course, is so we um, talked about what manipulatives are last time. Now let's go into more detail about the purpose of manipulatives. The purpose of manipulatives, in a nutshell, is to teach an arithmetic concept. We've talked and talked about teaching from scratch. We've also referred to the fact that you are digging and pouring their what? Foundation. Foundation. That's why we use manipulatives, not exclusively, but a lot more in first grade, second grade, etc. So the purpose of manip manipulatives are to teach arithmetic concepts. I've got some subpoints here. First one, the first purpose of a manipulative is to make an abstract idea become concrete. Abstract become concrete. Then it is a math concept that we understand. Abstract is something that's unfamiliar, confusing, and in their minds it doesn't make any sense. It's abstract, okay? So we want to, the first, specifically, the first purpose of a manipulative is to make an abstract idea become a concrete math concept. So there are three types of ideas and concepts, three types, concrete, semi-concrete, and abstract. Okay? Concrete is something that is familiar, already understood, and is usually based in physical objects. And when we're using something that's concrete, it is something that they can handle. That's why we call these manipulatives. So concrete is something that's familiar. It's already understood. It's part of their understanding. <coughs> Semi-concrete 
is something that they can visualize. So if we're talking about math, um, teaching techniques and tools, concrete would be a manipulative. Semi-concrete would be what? A visual. And then abstract involves symbols and problems that are new and unfamiliar. The teacher doing the most um, the most <coughs> manipulatives is the kindergarten and early childhood teacher, first grader, and then um, second grade and so forth. Think from the very, 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 very beginning. What do you have to teach kindergartners and probably even pre-kindergarten? You have to teach them that What does that mean? What does that shape mean to a four-year-old, five-year-old? It has no meaning. That is abstract. It's not abstract to us. But abstract is symbols, and these symbols have to progress from semi-concrete, visual aid, to concrete, manipulative. So what are you doing with your small child? Early childhood. Your you have to teach them that that symbol represents two physical objects. Okay? Now these three levels, of course, change as students old or get older and mature. But that, at the very, very beginning, is just a symbol. It is abstract. So we have to use concrete objects for them to understand what that shape means. And then as we get older, as they get older, we have to then progress to being able to do this. I don't know why I'm writing so big. Probably because I'm thinking primary. Then we have to progress to this that they're going to see on their flashcard. But see, we're not going to understand that flashcard because they're going to see the symbols. That's semi-concrete. They have the visual aid, the flashcard, but then they have to know what 3 plus 2 is as a kindergartner and what does Mrs. Brader and now Mrs. Schrock do. Objects. Two pencils plus three pencils. Put them together. What is that? A cross. They don't know what a plus is or a dash is. And then we have to do the same thing with subtraction. So you get the idea of what a manipulative is and what a manipulative is and why we're talking about it in primary math, not intermediate. Intermediate, we have a whole different kind of abstract. In intermediate, we have to learn the fact that <coughs> we can use a letter to stand in the place of a number. What's that called? That's a variable. What branch of mathematics uses variables? Algebra. And that's a whole nother progression. Now, I don't bring in objects to Algebra 1. Okay, but we do have to transition from concrete to variables. And that takes a long transition, doesn't it? Okay, so there are three types of, of concepts and ideas. Concrete, semi-concrete, abstract. Applying that to teaching, concrete is a manipulative. To teach a concrete, we use manipulative. To, to make an idea concrete, we use manipulative. So they can see with their understanding and move things around, and the light bulb comes on because they're going to actually feel the two, the three, coming together as five. Okay? Um, and we are backing that up with our flashcards. We're backing that up with our family recitations. And so all of those things are going to work together to understand what addition is or what subtraction is. Okay? Um, so there are three types of concepts. The familiar, the concrete, it's already a part of their understanding. To reach that, 
teaching techniques are called what? Manipulatives. Then the semi-concrete is something that they have to start visualizing and we use visual aids for that. I think the flashcards abstract is the very beginning of learning what these symbols even mean. Okay, so concept or uh, methodology-wise, concrete uses manipulatives. Semi-concrete, we're now that's where we engage their hands. Semi-concrete, we're starting to engage their eyes. Okay, abstract is still, of course, engaging their eyes, but they're <coughs> random symbols almost. <coughs> okay, does they have to learn what those symbols mean? All right, so we want to make the abstract become concrete. So there's three types of ideas, three different methodologies to handle each one. And then keep in mind that the younger the child, including primary students, the younger the child, child the student, I'm not going to use the word kids. What are kids? baby goats. Students, the younger the children, the younger the students, the younger the pupils. I don't like that one. It just makes me think of eyeballs. But um, the younger the students, the more, the more ma arithmetic, math concepts and procedures, the more are abstract, the more abstract concepts are. Okay, so as the, the younger the student is, the younger the child is, the more things, but not things, the more math ideas, the more math concepts are abstract. Okay, so we have a lot more work cut out because we have no foundation. So that's why the last point is, that's why manipulatives are required to lay, are required when laying math foundations. And that's what you're doing. Okay, so the younger the students are, the more things are abstract to them, right? And then that's why manipulatives are required when laying foundations in math. All right, so the first purpose, obviously the purpose of manipulatives is to teach arithmetic concepts. First purpose is to make an abstract become concrete. Another purpose, and kind of almost we could even say goals, of manipulatives is to reach the student's understanding. We've got to reach their understanding. Obviously, they see with their eyes. Okay, and this is the first idea. We want them to do more than see with their eyes. We want them to see with their understanding. Okay, one thing that I noticed by listening to my own recordings and watching them is that I frequently say, do you see what I mean? Well, obviously you see what I wrote. Do you see what I mean? Okay, that's what I mean when we're talking about reaching their understanding. Obviously they can see with their eyes, but you want them to see with their understanding. You want them not just to see what you wrote, you want them to see what you mean. Okay, a lot of times I might say, does that make sense? They have to make sense of it in their mind. And what's going to help them make sense of something in their mind? A manipulative. Why do I borrow 10? Well, that's place value is base 10. But you're not going to tell that to the first grader or the second grader. But they'll be able to see why they need more in the ones column and they'll be able to understand what's going on and they'll be able to understand why 13 minus 8 is 5 okay because they will see that there are 13 straws in there and when you're using the manipulatives you got to go back to the counting how many straws are in there count them that's physical that's getting their hands about count them now take away 8 for real Pull them out of there, all eight of them. How many are left? Five. And that's going to start solidifying the concept that 13 minus eight is five. That's what we don't teach borrowing until we start learning the teen families and the addition families. Those are critical 
because anytime we do a larger subtraction problem with borrowing, we're making teens, aren't we? So they have to know 11 minus 9 is 2. They have to know 11 minus 3 is 8. They have to know 11 minus 7 is 4, right? All of those things because then they'll understand what's going on. And then we bring in the drill, okay? And so everything's firing on all four cylinders. We're reciting the family. We're doing the flashcards. We're understanding what, why. <coughs> then we can do procedures in a bigger problem like borrowing. Then we can actually do real subtraction and not just flashcard subtraction. Okay, so um, we want to reach the student's understanding. We want them to not just see with their eyes, we want them to see with their understanding. You want them to not just see what you wrote, you want them to see what you mean. I've got C in quotes. You understand what I'm saying? They're understanding it in their mind. Okay, so we want to reach their understanding. We want them to to see with their understanding. We want them to see what you mean, okay? Secondly, this involves answering the question why. So if we're gonna reach their understanding, they have to see what I mean, not just see what I wrote, and they have to, we, they have to understand the why. It answers the question why. Why is 13 minus eight five? Because it is. <laughs> actually that, when we actually move the pieces around. It's really gonna be five, isn't it? All right, this, that's also gonna give them confidence in their facts, because they've seen it. Um, to, look, to use slang, they've seen it for real. Okay. All right, so the second goal is to reach the student's understanding. They've got to see it with their mind. They've got to understand it. They have to know why. We've got to make sure that we use the manipulatives to answer the question why. Why is 13 minus 8, 5? Because it is for real. And they can see that, and they've done it with their hands. There's all kinds of um, statistics about what you remember of what you just hear, you just heard. I'm getting kind of bad with that. I can't remember what I heard here. But if I write it down, I'll remember it, even if I don't look at it again. Just the physical part of me writing it down, I will remember. Okay? Then if I do something, I'm going to remember it. So you, re you, you know, remember X percent of what you hear. You remember a higher percent of what you heard and saw. But what are you going to remember the highest percent of what you heard, saw, and did? That's the purpose of the manipulative, okay? All right, so third point. The purpose of manipulatives is to make an abstract concept concrete. The second purpose of our manipulative is to reach the student's understanding. The third purpose um, is kind of a restatement, but what I, I, I wanted to stress it, and that's the idea of really teaching. Did you know that you can teach and not teach? You can get up and spout information and um, not really teach. One of the disadvantages of me teaching college <coughs> is that the teaching style is a lot different and it kind of ruins <laughs> my teaching at seventh grade. Think about that, what do I mean? What do I mean by that? Well, I'm used to teaching college students. So then when I go to teach seventh grade math, I have a tendency to do what? assume that they know too much. I have a tendency to assume that they already understand what I'm talking about. And unless I really make, force myself, I have to make sure I realize, okay, um, right now in seventh grade math, I am teaching negative numbers. 
Negative numbers are so easy. And it's also been a little confusing for me because I'm teaching the same concepts in intermediate math, how to teach them. And I, I'm getting mixed up what I said where. Okay, so teaching in the academy helps me be a better college teacher, but teaching in the college does not help me be a better academy teacher. Does that make sense to you? I have to fight the tendency to treat the seventh graders like I treat you. I cannot do that. I don't usually have the problem treating you like seventh graders. <laughs> it's always going the other way. And that kind of is the idea that I'm talking about here. You have to really teach. Even more, you, the younger the students are, um, the more you have to really teach. So manipulative is going to help you really teach. Do you understand what I mean by really teach? Um, let me give you some points about what I mean by really teach. First of all, I'm talking about really teaching. Teaching goes beyond, and I mean really teaching, really teaching goes beyond telling the students how. Teaching is not telling. And sometimes students want that. They just want you to tell them, tell them how to do it. Don't bother me with learning, really learning. I just want to get my homework done. I just want to pass seventh grade math. I don't care about learning. <coughs> so teaching is not telling. Okay? Um, so teaching, next, teaching, really teaching goes beyond the how and reaches or explains the why. Goes beyond the how and explains the why. Okay, so teaching is not telling. Teaching is explaining. Do you remember the definition of teaching from first semester? Teaching is confirming for what? Joint possession. So if I've taught you a math concept, you now possess that math skill. Okay, so teaching goes beyond telling the students how to do math. Teaching progresses, doesn't just show how, teaching explains why. Next, teaching ties can, uh, concepts together. Teaching ties concepts together. Often you can show students that they've already done this before. They've already learned this concept before. We're just using it in a different way. Now, I'm not experienced in teaching at primary level, so I can't give you a good primary example, but I can give you a good algebra example. Okay, I, am, I teach seventh grade math and ninth grade algebra one. Um, in algebra, I have the freshmen, so I am laying their high school math foundation. I'm laying their algebra foundation along with pre-algebra in seventh grade also. But I'm trying to reach their understanding so that they can do well in algebra two and even some of the pre-calculus and <coughs> the, the upper math that they see in high school. So many times I can tie things together and I can show them how this is the same thing that we did in arithmetic. It's exactly the same thing. You've done this before. Sometimes I'll say to the ninth graders even, Mrs. Haiti taught you this. Well, Mrs. Haiti taught most of them fourth grade math where they learned how to add fractions and subtract fractions. I'm teaching them five years later how to add and subtract what we call rational expressions in algebra. Guess what they are? They're just fractions with letters, okay? And guess how we find a common denominator in algebra so that we can add our fractions in algebra? The same way that you do in arithmetic. Do you remember I taught you, when we were reviewing your math concepts, three scenarios with a denominator? Guess what three scenarios I used, I used about a month ago in algebra one? The same thing. So teaching ties concepts together. Teaching shows the whole p 
picture. I'm not just teaching them, here's how you do this problem. Oh, and when you see this, do this. Math is not a series of puzzles that they have to solve. Math is not a bunch of steps to memorize and hopefully use them at the right time. That's not really teaching. Do you understand what I mean by that? That's how concepts get confused because the understanding was not reached. Um, actually, there's many cases where um, it's just a shame that people do not have math skills because they didn't, from the very beginning, they weren't really taught math. Okay? So you're the teacher and you are giving the students the opportunity, so you need to learn math, so you need to really teach math. Okay? So teaching, really teaching goes beyond telling. Teaching is not telling. Teaching goes beyond how to do the problem and explains why the problem works the way it works. Um, teaching ties concepts together. You've already done this before. Now we're just doing it to a different kind of number. Or Mrs. Brader already taught you this. Okay, if you're in second grade and you had Mrs. Brader for first grade and I'm Miss Maven, I'll say, oh, Mrs. Brader already taught you this. And you're already overcoming the math phobia okay um, then teaching applies concept to procedure okay and then we don't have to memorize procedure so really teaching the last point really teaching does not depend on memorization I've said this I don't know how many times memorization is a poor learning technique so that means it's a poor teaching method you're not going to understand by memorizing <coughs> memorization at best is a means to the end it um, it's a stopgap it's a temporary fix until the understanding catches up does that make sense to you Yes, we memorize. Yes, we recite the tables. That's a stopgap until we understand the concept. The concept will catch up if we really teach. Okay, so manipulatives make the abstract become concrete. Manipulatives reach the student's understanding. And manipulatives will help you to really teach. Okay, because teaching is not telling. Now, requirements. What is required before we can call this a manipulative? First of all, first requirement, they must be hands-on. That means they are physical objects that the student can pick up, handle, move around, group take away, add. Those are verbs we want to do with physical objects. A couple points underneath that. Student hands, not teacher hands. Well, we start with teacher hands, but whose hands? Student hands. We progress from teacher hands to student hands. So concentrate on making it student hands your hands not my hands okay a second requirement underneath that is that they have to be objects or pieces that they can move not visuals that they only see objects pieces containers that they can move not just see not just point. They have to be able to, it has to be something they can pick up in their hands. Objects are pieces they can move, not just visuals that they see. We're going to use visuals, but it's not a manipulative. Okay? Then the second requirement. They must be hands-on. Second requirement. Is they must serve a teaching purpose. First of all, not a time filler. 
You don't have enough time anyways. And Delta would be a problem. Not just fun or entertaining or playing around. We're not just entertaining them. We're not just occupying, so we're not filling time. So we're not just occupying time. And we're not just entertaining or playing. <coughs> we're not doing them just to do them. They must serve a teaching purpose. Um, however, I said they're not playing. They should be available during recess and play times. Let them play with them. I don't mean that, but not in class. We use them in class. We learn how to manipulate them. Then they should be available at lunchtime and break time or recess time, whatever your setup happens to be. Let them play with them. They'll, they can play with them and use them on their own and try to play with, play with them. Of course, you have to make them be responsible and so forth. So we're not just entertaining or playing and we're not filling time. They must serve a teaching purpose. Third, they must illustrate a math concept. Okay, we've already talked about this. It has to be a concept. Third requirement, it must be followed up with three things. We don't just do the manipulative and leave it. <laughs> it must be followed up with teaching, tethering, and practicing. It must be followed up with teaching, tethering, and practicing. Okay, so requirements, now advantages. Advantages of using manipulatives. Generates interest. It's new and different, so you're not just doing the same old, same old. It generates interest. It's something new and different, so we're not just the whole hum, same old math class. <coughs> Secondly, it can bring about true understanding of a foundational concept. It can, if it's done properly, bring about true understanding of a foundational math concept. Third, it provides opportunities to develop math skills. And other skills following directions, right? Being decently and in orderly in class time, not going to chaos, and responsibility. You can use students to help you pass out materials. You use students to help you put them away. You use students to help you keep them organized. So you can, do, you can even use them for practical skills as well as your math skills. And then it builds successful math students. Advantages. Disadvantages. The first disadvantage is a lot, to use slang. A lot of time can be consumed by the use and preparation. A lot of time in both class when you're using them and in your out of class preparation. It takes up a lot of time. A second advantage can be Logistical, space, storage. Okay. I wonder how much stuff Mrs. Brader has. <laughs> okay. Space, storage, etc. A third <coughs> disadvantage can be cost. Are any of those disadvantages, those are kind of logistical. A fourth one is keeping classroom <coughs> control. So it can become a time waster. 
Okay? But most of those, the first three, those are not educational disadvantages, are they? Okay? All right, so <coughs> advantages, disadvantages. Um, types of manipulatives. The best type is whole class. All the students have their own set of objects. And we can do them together. This is the best. This is 100% participation. But it's also the most expensive and the most time consuming. Whole class. Second type of manipulative is small group. Three to five students, or even two, three, I wouldn't go more than four or five. Small group, maximum five. Students that share, share the objects and perform the activity together. This has advantages. It can be more practical, <coughs> logistically. It does keep more students working with limited resources, <coughs> but, and it, there's another one, another positive, it, it fosters cooperation between students. We do need to learn how to work with others. Okay? Does not play well with others. <laughs> no. But, but it requires classroom control. That's a disadvantage. And another but would be that some students will sit back and let others do all the work. It does have the danger of certain students not participating. But that can be monitored and corrected. Okay. Sometimes in drill you might have so-and-so sit down because they're all waiting for him or her. All right, that's you saw that. Then individual manipulatives is a single set done in front of the class in more of a demonstration and less of an activity. It's more of a demonstration, less of an activity. Um, of course, advantages is that it takes less time and it is the easiest to do. And it can be done more frequently. So I'm not discounting this one at all. It does take less time. It's the easiest. You can do it <coughs> more frequently. But the disadvantage is it is the least effective. But we can counter that. Teacher does it. So-and-so comes up and everybody watches. That is less class participation. But this is still much better than nothing. <coughs> okay. So... Um, those are the types of manipulatives. Next, warnings, warnings, cautions, warnings. Number one, the use of manipulatives does not guarantee learning. The use of manipulatives does not guarantee learning. It must be, they must be followed up with the abstract. Or they must be applied to actual problems. Or they're not any good. They have to be applied. It's not just playing around. The use of manipulatives does not guarantee learning unless they're followed up with the abstract <laughs> concept. They're followed up with the application. They have to be applied or they're not effective. So the use of manipulatives does not guarantee learning. They must, must, must be applied or they're not effective. Okay? 
you apply them to the abstract concepts, you apply them to an actual problem. Do you understand that? The use of manipulatives does not guarantee learning. They must be followed up. They must be applied to the abstract concept or applied to actual problems. Next, classroom order can be lost. The use of manipulatives will generate noise, movement that can lead to behavior problems. Classroom order must be maintained. The use of manipulatives generates noise, movement that can lead to behavior problems. Okay? Next, tips. Tips. First tip is in management. Storage distribution. Um, storage can be a problem and it can be expensive. But you want as much as possible to have individualized kits and a means <coughs> to store them in some type of durable container. You want to have kits, whether they're individual ones or teacher kits where you keep the stuff together in some type of durable container. So storage is a problem space and expense wise. You want to store them in durable containers. And an another tip here is to have a spare parts container when pieces get lost. So you have to be organized outside of class. Next, distribution. We're talking about management of manipulatives. Distribution, you must have a system. You have an organized, uh, an organized team of helpers. So you have to have a system to distribute. You have an organized team of helpers. And then you have a procedure that you follow every time. You tell them what to do, you train them and how you, and you have certain, some people have row captains or group leaders that, okay, and you have an organized way for them to go and get their stuff, et cetera. Expense can be avoided. <coughs> Expense can be avoided. You don't have to buy them. You can collect them. You can go to garage sales, or you can buy them cheaply. They don't have to be elaborate kits that you <coughs> bought from a teacher's store or from a catalog. Those are extremely expensive. You can make your own. Though you do want to invest in containers. Okay? So, tips, then guidelines for presentation. Number one, I've got six of them. Plan carefully. Think through how it's going to work. What am I going to say? And so forth. Number two, rehearse procedures. Guidelines in your presentation. Plan carefully. Rehearse your procedures. Number three, keep it simple. Doesn't have to be elaborate. Doesn't have to be this fancy thing you bought for $100. Next, strive for as much participation as possible. Number five, create anticipation. You gotta build up to it. And last, anticipate mistakes and problems and chaos. Anticipate mistakes and problems and chaos.